My name is uh, Kobe Sconard. I'm the CEO at IdeaWake. Uh, so we are a Milwaukee-based company uh, in the United States, and uh, we'll give a little more context uh, into us and you know just what um, you know how we have the insights that we do about you know running uh, these types of campaigns and uh, really what our focus is for today uh, and the agenda. It's quite an action-packed one. Uh, for some folks, uh, I see some familiar faces in here. Um, some of you have seen a lot of this content before. A lot of the time, it's a really good refresher, though. Uh, for those who are, you know, it's the first time going through, uh, as Maximilian said, we'll share things out afterwards because uh, we kind of go a mile a minute here. So agenda, first, we're going to go through gaining leadership buy-in uh, and really understanding why we run one of these programs in the first place, uh, understanding goals and target outcomes in terms of measuring engagement um, and also what actual success looks like. Uh, then from there, we'll go into determining governance, IT considerations, and selecting a tool that's best to power your process, then going through promotion and communications, and common obstacles, best practices, and closing with Q&A. Uh, so like I said, action packed, looking forward to it today. Outcomes that I really wanna leave you with today uh, is really set you up for success in terms of being able to present this and gain the buy-in that you need to receive ideas that will produce a measurable impact, whatever that measurable impact means to your organization, uh, engage a high percentage of your workforce, and then of course, help you look like a rock star to your leadership team. Just a little background on IdeaWake. Uh, so uh, we're doing uh, innovation programs and the software is being used in over 39 countries, 185 cities. Uh, we have some great partners um, in terms of uh, you know, industries. We're in 14 different verticals uh, from healthcare uh, to um, financial services, advanced manufacturing. And the reason the folks will reach out to us, really one of three reasons and really why you know, we're doing this talk today uh, is building a culture of innovation, helping drive not just financial, but also whatever the impact is that you're looking for at your organization, all with a um, you know, underlying theme of increasing employee engagement. So one of the big things that we're seeing right now is you know, the great resignation. I'm sure many have heard it in terms of trends, uh, but what we're finding um, is that out of the Gallup G12, we're able to run by running these challenges uh, and really empowering folks with a voice, we're able to materially improve two of those factors. Um, and there's several ways you can improve the other 10 as well. So gaining buy-in for your uh, innovation challenge or overall ideation program. So this stat is getting a little bit outdated, but um, it's you know still relevant, I would say, today as we're, we're coming out of things and, and we're you know facing some wins from a market environment. Uh, so overall, according to a recent McKinsey study, it's about a year old now, uh, they believe that 90% of uh, uh, respondents said that COVID is going to fundamentally change the way that they do business. And they're concerned, 85% were concerned that COVID-19 is going to have a lasting effect on how customers, um, you know, uh, what customers expect out of, right, the uh, brands that they work with. Uh, and then as of the study, um, and actually there's a recent update to this, it's only up to about 25% now, uh, but 21 to 25% feel like they have the expertise, resources, and tools to actually adapt to the change that's coming. Now, this one is also a stat that many of you have probably seen before, but I always it, it still always boggles my mind uh, that in the last 15 years, 52% of Fortune 500 companies have disappeared. This has actually accelerated a little bit uh, since the last measurement I was able to find. Um, so average life expectancy was 75 years in 1955, down to 15 years in 2015. That's about a decrease of a year on average of life expectancy over each year between 55 and 2015. And really what this means is no industry is safe from new models of delivery, uh, from transportation. Obviously, they thought they were too big to fail. Came Uber, Blockbuster to Netflix. And now we're actually just seeing Amazon Care. I've had this slide for a couple of years now. Um, and Amazon Care is really in the PCP space starting to, um, you know, formally launch uh, and take hold. So it'll be really interesting over the next, you know, year to or two to see how um, that disrupts the traditional modes of delivering healthcare. Really what this means for everybody here is, uh, and for you know, your companies, is that you need to continually reinvent yourselves and frontline employees offer a diverse perspective. They don't just have ideas to improve HR, so we do our own primary research. Uh, in 2021, we did uh, the State of Employee Ideas in 2021, uh, and it asked, uh, you know, it was about a series of 15 questions about, uh, about how employees felt that their employers listened to them and their ideas. So it was 700 employees throughout the continent of the United States. Out of those respondents, those that had ideas, this is the distribution. Um, so these have material financial impact and also right, improving customer experience. 
here's some examples of employee ideas. Amazon Prime is always my favorite, uh, but you'd think that these ideas like Amazon Prime would come from the marketing department, actually came from a software engineer. And overall, outside of doing disruptive innovation, um, which some, the jury's out in my opinion, uh, folks inside of the front lines of large companies can come up with very disruptive innovation and disruptive ideas, uh, but sometimes it's hard to get leadership to really get behind that. But overall, looking at the environment that we're in right now, I'd say hitting home on continuous improvement and just really looking at folks who are closest to a process of the best insights on how to improve it. And that's intuitive for leadership teams as well. Uh, and if this weren't the case, we wouldn't help companies like exam one save $1.4 million in six months. Uh, we'll send out several other you know, case studies uh, after this as well, just more than anything, whether you, as we'll get into in a minute, uh, use a dedicated platform like IdeaWake or use just to get started like uh, Microsoft Teams or just using Microsoft Forms plus Excel. Uh, running these programs is super beneficial. And there's several examples now uh, of employees, you know, this is a 2% increase in margin uh, in six months for, you know, very large company. Uh, so there's several examples of this. Employees have ideas to save money that are quick wins. The last piece here, going into that great resignation um, and going into uh, you know the trend today of it being hard to attract and retain talent. Uh, and as of 2017, and this number actually has gone down a bit since, uh, of workers, 30% of workers agree that their opinions count at work. But if we increase this from 30 to 60%, according to that same study, uh, we'd see a 27% reduction in turnover, 40% reduction in safety incidents, and a 12% increase in productivity. So making folks feel like they have a voice and like they're empowered with a voice is one of those, like I said, Gallup G12 metrics that we really focus on improving by running these types of campaigns. And just uh, a proof point on this, uh, like I said, we've got several of these that we can share out, but Squaw Valley Alpine Meadows is probably the most drastic. Uh, they saw a 74% increase in terms of employee learning and engagement uh, in six months, according to McKinsey's Organizational Health Index. So before we actually dive into like the tactical side of planning out these challenges um, after we build buy-in, let's just define what they are first. Uh, normally, when people think of you know employee suggestion programs, they think of a suggestion box. Uh, what we try to focus on is what we call innovation challenges. And they're focused on being a specific topic related to an organizational goal. Uh, so they're not always open all the time, as you see in the time-based section, but they're a defined process to evaluate and select ideas after we actually collect them. So we know where things are going and why. Uh, and then they are time-based, so we don't keep them open throughout the year. Um, really what it focuses on is if you treat it like a, you know, uh, a marketing event, right? Like a launch, you have the ability to build a lot more momentum behind it. Um, and then also you can control the influx of ideas as well. The worst thing that could happen is if you collect a bunch of ideas, right? And then um, after you collect all those ideas, nothing happens with them and you don't communicate to frontline staff where they're going. Uh, that'll be one of the quickest things to basically decrease engagement and, and kill the program quickly. Uh, we'll get into those towards the end, uh, some of the other stuff that came out of the study that we did in 2021. So this process, right, uh, every process uh, looks a little bit different, uh, but this is just 40,000 foot view. You post a challenge topic uh, related to an organizational goal, like I had mentioned. Uh, you go through and collect ideas, evaluate and prioritize those, select and award winners, test and implement. Um, there's obviously several sub steps in each one of these that we can share out afterwards. But overall, like when you think through this and present it, it's nice to just see this 40,000 foot view. Now let's go into understanding our goals and desired outcomes. And I'd say one of the biggest uh, mistakes that we see is when folks come to us, um, they try to run before they can walk. And a lot of the time, it's just the expectations from senior leadership. They wanna start a program in order to go towards this transformational that we see right here. This is what they're imagining when they imagine innovation. Uh, the problem is that you're expected as a team of one, a lot of the time to be able to deliver. Um, on you know something when you only have a budget to actually deliver on transformational when you have an incremental budget. Uh, we see this literally every day. Uh, and we actually made this uh, chart um, as a result of it. So really when leadership comes in and they wanna get this program going, uh, they're trying to build out really complex solutions. And once again, you're an innovation team of one over here. So the resourcing and the capacity that you have as an organization to actually implement, develop and implement innovation itself. It's like a muscle. 
Um, expectations are set here when you're not being set up for success because the resourcing that you're getting and the experience of the organization is really sitting here. So what we like to um, really focus on is setting the right expectations with senior leadership teams up front. It's not the easiest thing to do. It's easy to look at it in this graph, but it's, it's really just having those conversations so that everybody understands what the deliverables are going to be, especially in like year one. Uh, you can think of these as like one year cycles. They could be six month cycles if you get, want to get really crazy with it. Uh, but overall, what we're really focused on in the beginning for a bottom up innovation program is engaging a high percentage of our workforce and getting some type of projected value um, out of the system. So out of two to three innovation challenges that you'd run, uh, you go through and you're able to hopefully test about 15 ideas, 10 to 15 submissions and pilot four to six of them. Really overall, what you're looking for though is, hey, this is the projected value over time that we expect. When you go into the run phase, one more thing, when we look down here and who, who's overseeing the work, I'm sure many of the folks in here, right, you're starting off as an innovation, an army of one. Uh, but what happens over time is if you can build this uh, buy-in from leadership and set the expectations right, we call them enabling events. So you have a really good enabling event that happens. You get a really high engagement rate for the first challenge that you run. You're able to get, you know, a lot of projected value out of that in terms of dollar savings, as an example. That gives an enabling event that allows you to add at least maybe a couple more part-time resources to your team or even, you know, another one or two full-time. Um, and it allows you to start to go left to right here um, on this table. So once again, this will be shared out afterwards. I know there's a ton of text in here. Um, but this is one of the you know favorite slides of a lot of our customers uh, and folks that we interact with. So going into how to actually create uh, effective challenge statements, and this can also be used for setting those program expectations up front in terms of like projected value. Uh, what we do first is we list our short and long-term objectives. And we have two examples that you see right below here, one related to manufacturing, one related to the healthcare space. Uh, you set uh, specifics on scope and or timeframe. And then you combine both of those things together to create challenge statements. So if your goal is to reduce manufacturing line scrap, you set a specific metric of 5% in 2019, then you combine those two things into challenge statements. Going into governance uh, process and the collection strategy itself. So looking at the workflow and evaluation criteria, we really suggest, and this was on that previous slide that I had shared, uh, to make sure to um, uh, focus on things that are quick wins. The more that you can focus on those quick wins up front that are low complexity, low cost to implement, and fast to implement. Uh, if you're able to do that and focus your evaluation criteria on that, um, then you're going to be able to actually implement things quicker, build more buy-in for the program that unlocks more resources. So other things that I'd suggest as best practices uh, make sure that the people that are going to be um, ranking the submissions uh, are going to be involved in the evaluation. Excuse me. Make sure the folks who are going to be implementing things are involved in the evaluation process. And those people who will be implementing things are often going to be the budget owners of things. So you're going to want to make sure that folks that you're engaging in this process and you're building relationships with cross functionally in the organization uh, are going to have the ability and wherewithal to actually take action on the stuff that, that you're sending them uh, and that it aligns with their specific goals as well. Trying to keep the evaluate, trying to keep it simple. We just see sometimes the well, longest one I've seen is 25 evaluation criteria for an innovation challenge. Try to keep it to three maximum of, uh, I'd say five, this is 10 uh, metrics. It's just really difficult with the folks that are going to be evaluating things. They're not going to be able to take the time if you have 10 uh, to 15 evaluation criteria and you're evaluating like 50 ideas. Um, and then we already covered the last point, which is right, quick wins uh, more than anything in the beginning. Going into the um, uh, incentivizing participation and then we'll go into collection strategy after this. So there's uh, two, a couple different schools of thought on this. Uh, we find that offering monetary incentives uh, or non-monetary incentives upfront does help increase short-term engagement. Uh, the long-term engagement is gonna be driven a lot more by following best practice, really communicating with folks where things are going and why. Uh, you could be offering people a lot of money. They're not, they'll stop sharing if they don't hear feedback because uh, oftentimes I'll have to share 10 ideas before one even gets shortlisted. Going long-term, um, 
something that we found uh, is involving idea submitters in the implementation of ideas. This goes back to one of the things um, like drivers behind the great resignation that I keep referencing is that a lot of folks, when you look at the studies uh, that are entering the workforce today are looking to expand their horizons and skills and experiences at work beyond just their traditional job role. So if you give them the ability and empower them, uh, even if it's like a 10 hour um, a week role for four weeks, uh, I know everybody's short staffed right now, so that seems might seem crazy, some of you, uh, but it really does help increase engagement uh, in terms of giving folks the ability to grow within the organization and try new things. Uh, something else like the holy grail of where you want to get to, regardless of where you start in terms of incentives, uh, just like you have, you know, uh, 360 feedback uh, and you do like quarterly reviews or even annual, depending on the organization, you want to tie the expectation of people being innovative in the organization to reviews, just like you do for everything else that you're trying to measure success on, right? So if you're looking at employee performance, you want to make sure like whether the metric is based on number of ideas shared, that's a really common one early on, but making sure that whatever the metric is, it's, we'll share them out afterwards. There's about 10 different ones you can choose from, but simplest one is just, hey, everybody needs to come up with three ideas to improve the organization a year. Right, and then you're just bringing that up during the regular cadence of meetings that you have with frontline staff. So going into collection strategy for your program, uh, there's two different um, ways to do this. I had said, you know, what we really focus on is doing the time-based challenges versus doing a continuous collection. There's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, oftentimes we'll see companies, uh, they wanna do continuous collection. We highly suggest doing the time-based challenges just because it creates, like I said, a marketing event where we can really promote participation and get folks onto the platform or engaged in the program. Uh, then from there, it's easy to increase awareness about it. And then you can have the continuous, like always open in between those challenges. Uh, overall though, if you just have continuous, it's difficult to keep the program um, up and running without uh, follow keeping communication streamlined throughout the entire process and having it be continuous is very difficult for most folks. It's difficult for folks doing it in a limited and time-based fashion. So if you have a continuous program, making sure you have a solid communication plan in place. If you don't, the program is going to really quickly in the first like six months, you'll see a drastic decrease in engagement. So common formats that we see, um, you have, uh, three really different ones, hackathons and shark tanks, uh, design thinking workshops, and then online campaigns and innovation challenges, which is where we focus. Uh, the COVID like pandemic, right? Uh, now everybody's back in person, which is awesome, or most folks are in the US, uh, but these options weren't available. We're actually seeing a lot of them start to come back online. Uh, and some really interesting hybrid options as well. Um, before a lot of design thinking workshops would happen in a small group setting, uh, where you would only have right 10 people and it would be in a single location. Uh, we're seeing hybrid models now where you're bringing in insights from the crowd, you're running a campaign or challenge first, uh, and then kind of mixing and matching like hackathons and shark tanks and these design thinking workshops on top of these things, which is super interesting. So here's just some examples of challenge statements. Um, once again, you can see these afterwards. What we really like to do is start with a how might we question and then combine it with our goal. You'll notice that these don't have the specific time-based or a specific metric behind them, uh, which you want to do for best practice, uh, but these are just some thought starters for you. The conversation everybody loves to hate is just with IT considerations um, overall, right? I know that there's highly, and the environment we're living in today, a lot of security considerations and you have to have IT's blessing along with senior leadership teams in order to move forward. Uh, depending upon the tool that's going to power your process. Uh, so what I would say is like for folks that are looking to get started, uh, but don't have any budget in place, right? Or you're like, hey, we're just trying to get our feet wet. Um, if you're under 50 participants and you're trying to engage employees internally or customers externally, just starting with the Google form, assuming that you have a really good, um, uh, really good communication strategy in place. I sound like a broken record right now. Um, that's doable. If you're under 50 participants, you can use like a Slack channel um, or Microsoft Teams. There's a couple add-ons there, but as soon as you go over the 50 mark, uh, I'd suggest getting a dedicated platform, especially if you're planning on doing these on a regular basis. Uh, a lot of the folks now are powered by Microsoft Teams, I know, uh, but 
whether it's Idea Wake or somebody else uh, out there in the market, there's plenty of uh, great providers. Um, you have the ability to hook Microsoft Teams into uh, our applications a lot of the time uh, or embed our application right into Microsoft Teams itself. Once again, it just comes down to the communication and the automation when you're doing this at any type of scale uh, in order to help save you time. This goes into why I say communication is so important. So out of that same survey we did, uh, uh, State of Employee Ideas in 2021, uh, out of the 700 respondents we had, uh, of the folks who said they had ideas, this is the reason that they stopped sharing if they had ideas previously. 22%, so literally one in five respondents, said that they stopped sharing because they felt like an idea that they had shared previously fell into a black hole. Not receiving recognition was a close second. So that's why it's critical to have a feedback loop right when you make a decision around the idea but also what's really nice uh, about using you know a dedicated platform um or any type even if you use microsoft teams just having real-time collaboration uh, amongst peers so folks can leave feedback on each other's ideas and support them is something that's super beneficial as well uh, to increase and incentivize the actual engagement in your program going into promoting your program uh so we have um, a lot of opinions on this for just how to communicate effectively. Uh, another reason that we like doing the time-based campaigns is it allows you to just create that marketing event. Um, but going into online promotion methods, uh, company e-newsletters, intranet, pre-launch emails, we have TV slideshows on here now that folks are back in person. Um, uh, so there's like, think about like digital front door in terms of your intranet. Uh, if you have any type of like slider getting incorporated into that, I would also say the really obvious one um, is Microsoft Teams or Slack, whatever your organization is, is being powered by. Um, making sure that it's being distributed through those channels as well is super effective. Just some best practices uh, for like emails that you're sending or the communications uh, that we see work effectively is if you have a dedicated brand behind the uh, program, we often see that that works the best uh, in terms of like getting recognition for it. Uh, focusing on employee empowerment, keeping it simple for how the program works. Uh, and then also this down here uh, we found is like, it's not the single greatest driver of engagement, but for initial sign up rate, it's it has a really, really immaterial impact if it's signed by the CEO of the organization, just showing that there's tone at the top buy-in for the program. It helps significantly improve engagement, uh, especially from middle managers promoting the program to frontline staff. Going into some of these other things, e-newsletters and intranet, we'll share this out afterwards, uh, but just takes collaboration with IT. So just try to plan a little bit in advance. I'd say give four to six weeks, depending on your organization. Uh, that's normally the thing that takes the longest in addition to IT approval for whatever tool set you're using. So we actually have offline promotion methods back now, but you, know, you can actually use offline promotion materials online still. Uh, we'd say like company kickoff party or like a, a all hands meeting is now really common, I know, on Zoom formats, even though folks are going back to the office. So when we say company kickoff party, um, like if you have a meeting that's all hands, announcing it at that and having the CEO announce that, we found it super effective. Also hooking into any type of regularly scheduled weekly or monthly department meetings uh, and just getting five minutes of FaceTime if you're the one promoting the program, uh, especially you know during, um, I'd say, a week leading up to it. Looking at some of the offline promotion materials, once again, these can also be distributed online uh, that we've seen work well. Once again, the messaging is uniform in terms of how to participate, keeping it to the rule of threes uh, as much as possible, um, and just overall keeping it simple. This goes into the company kickoff events like I just mentioned uh, previously, and then the weekly and monthly department meetings. The number one driver of engagement overall that we've seen, and oftentimes it's, it's difficult for organizations to, um, depending upon how geographically dispersed you are, build these out, but having champion networks uh, is something that is a huge driver of engagement. When we say champions, what we normally, <clears throat> what we mean, that term gets used so commonly now, I feel like, uh, in the vernacular of corporations, is we're looking for folks that are uh, our boots on the ground who are helping promote the program. So. Uh, they normally characteristics of them are going to be the folks that interact with frontline staff the most throughout the day, just in their daily working lives. Uh, so in like a nursing environment, it would be charge nurse as an example. 
um, versus a legal firm, it actually might be like um, office admin. So it's the person who's going to have the most influence by seeing people the most throughout the day uh, as a function of their regular working life. So depending upon how your organization makeup looks, you can do it based upon department or based upon location. Uh, like I said, if you are a 160,000 person company uh, doing this, it's hard to get you know all the layers down to the front lines of the organization. So oftentimes you might have to go to like a manager level uh, if you're a very large company, but just making sure that wherever you're rolling this out, that there's a person that's dedicated to helping promote the program when it goes live. Some of those responsibilities for champions, especially if they're closer to frontline staff, promoting participation is number one. Uh, but if you're using something that's gonna allow for coll real-time collaboration between peers, uh, having folks to help uh, spur the conversation and also vote for ideas up front is something that we uh, really suggest for our champions that we work with. Just two other points here. Uh, all communication should focus on empowering employees with the voice as much as possible. Once again, just tying back to that Gallup G12 survey. And then we suggest actually over uh, avoid using the term innovation and use ideas and suggestions wherever possible. Um, so we're actually doing another test on this currently, but overall, when you look at innovation, we did this uh, test a couple of times, um, like a year and a half back. And what we found is that Innovation converts less in terms of open rate and click through rate versus ideas and suggestions. Our assumption behind that, we can't be like certain, but it really comes down to the fact that people might not see themselves as innovative. They do see themselves as having ideas or suggestions. So we're going to make making ideas happen in a separate um, uh, section just because I want to have time for questions. Uh, but I would say overall, just making sure that you have a program or a process, excuse me, in place and that you're looping in department managers or at least making them aware uh, before you actually take the challenge live uh, that, you know, ideas are potentially going to be coming their way. Also understanding what their specific goals are uh, because of the fact you're going to have to partner with them on piloting and implementing the ideas that are actually submitted. So making sure that you have their buy-in and like you're aware of what they're looking for in terms of ideas um, is huge uh, and one of the most common mistakes that we see. We're gonna close out with just a couple of best practices, common obstacles, taking action. So a lot of these are just a rehash of what we covered already, but best practices making, you know, targeted and agile campaigns versus having something always open, or if you're gonna have something always open, make sure it's augmented with uh, challenges making sure you have a good communication plan in place, making these things cross-functional uh, whenever possible. Oftentimes we'll see folks start in a singular department, uh, but there's uh, like the Amazon Prime example, a lot of the time the best ideas to solve a problem are going to come from somewhere where the problem doesn't originate. Uh, so like I said, Amazon Prime is one of those examples um, which really hits home for most folks. Common challenges, um, we've really talked about these uh, mostly and how to address them, but the lack of engagement and ROI pieces is just making sure that you have a good comms plan up front and you're understanding the goals of the organization and really where we started in the beginning uh, of making sure that you set the right expectations with leadership so you have time to prove ROI uh, and you know aren't setting yourself up for failure from the beginning. Uh, making sure that you have a uh, process to prioritize things, depending on the amount of input that you're getting. Uh, IT is always, you know, backlogged. If you're, a lot of folks are still waterfall, uh, not agile shops. So IT is always, you know, has their roadmap done for two or three years out uh, that we find commonly. So securing IT resources can be difficult, um, but just some of the things that you can look at here, uh, some of this is forward thinking. I'm gonna focus on the IT side of stuff, uh, depending upon, Organization, right? Just rules of thumb are things to think about. Uh, over time, getting a percentage of IT time, this is a pipe dream in the very beginning. But as you build more uh, muscle for innovation in the organization, you'll see that over time with more success, you're gonna be able to work with IT more closely and actually get a certain percentage of time budgeted. Um, and then in the interim of that, uh, sometimes this isn't realistic, especially because of um, you know uh, security concerns for folks. Or, or corporate policies, but looking at 1099 contractors and then outsourcing um, some of the IT function when possible, especially when you're doing pilots of earlier stage projects. 
tactical mistakes that we often see making participation too complex. So if you have a form that has 15 form fields, you're not going to get a lot of ideas. So we suggest if you want to get a bunch of information about the idea, doing it in phases. Uh, so you collect, you know, three or four fields up front, and then you do a short list of the ideas, and then you have the folks that are shortlisted fill out those other 10 fields versus making them do it up front. Um, feedback and recognition. I don't need to say that one again. Um, but also not updating employees on the idea status, going back to ideas falling into a black hole. Once again, showing this piece of it, these two right here, just can't stress enough. You take one thing out of today, making sure that you have uh, a program in place to make sure that within two weeks of the challenge that you run closing, getting back to the submitters with status updates until an ultimate decision is made on their idea will be the single greatest driver of your success long-term with running these programs. Just remember 95% of the ideas you won't receive uh, that you do receive will not be implemented. So what we found um, from studies that we've done, not the state of employee ideas, but previous, employees don't care nearly as much about if their idea is implemented. They care a lot more about if they hear feedback on whether their idea is moving forward. With that, uh, we have some previews and resources that we'll share out with everybody afterwards. Um, so just really a lot of the things that we covered today, we have a full launch checklist that we'll share out with everybody that has an associated launch plan uh, that covers everything from right the challenge statements themselves all the way to making ideas happen. Uh, so with that, I am going to open up the floor for Q&A in just a moment. One other freebie we are offering for anybody who is interested uh, is just a free trial of our platform. Uh, so if you're interested in that, feel free to reach out to us afterwards. We're happy to set you up with one. Thank you, everybody. Okay, Kobe, thank you very much. And uh, Q&A is open. So if anybody has questions, feel free to not only type them in the chat, but you can unmute, unmute yourself and uh, ask directly. Otherwise, I can also read them out uh, from the chat. And uh, while you think of something, maybe I can ask a simple question. Uh, Kobe, have you seen, like from your experience, have you seen any significant differences in, in different industries? So if you compare health, healthcare, healthcare to retail, uh, is it more difficult to, to implement these ch innovation challenges in one or the other? So I would say uh, as a rule of thumb, it's what's more significant is the use case. So whether you're like the format, whether you're doing a hackathon, like uh, there's different formats for running these innovation challenges. To answer your question succinctly, in higher rate, more highly regulated industries, it's always harder to get things done. So uh, depending on when you're trying, where you're trying to innovate. So in healthcare, right, if you're doing anything that touches patient experience, you have to deal with uh, compliance and often a committee. So it's going to be more difficult to make things happen than if you didn't have to touch like a compliance committee, right? So healthcare traditionally or any highly regulated industry, it's often more, there's more steps to make ideas happen. Um, I would definitely say though, the thing to focus on there is just looping in um, IT in most organizations is a blocker to make things happen, but looping in IT, looping in compliance early on in the process and making them a stakeholder in the process uh, is something that we've seen have a lot of success. Well, maybe then I can ask another general question. Um, do you see any difference in Im implementing these challenges uh, if you compare a, a smaller company, it says, uh, let's say 500 to 1,000 people, as opposed to a much larger organization, 15,000 plus? Yep, uh, overall engagement rate. And that's like, I mean, that's like a no duh one, but um, it's much easier to get a higher activation and participation rate um, at a 500 person company than it is at a 10,000 person. You'll get a higher quantity of ideas and higher overall, quote unquote, like activity, but it's because you're at much larger volume of audience. Um, other piece uh, that we found going back to your question about, you know, uh, where industries, is it difficult to get things done in specific industries? Company size also just like naturally you're gonna have more layers of management uh, and more decision-making nodes that you have to work through. So smaller the company, oftentimes as long as you're below like a thousand is where we really see the threshold where it's a lot easier to make things happen than if you go over a thousand. Uh, there's more bureaucracy essentially that you have to work through. And we have a question from uh, Carson. Do you have any suggestions on how to get senior leader buy-in when, uh, when they're hesitant? Thanks, Carson. Um, <laughs> I would say um, 
overall, like just show anecdotal examples that folks are going to understand, uh, depending, like I like the Amazon prime example, uh, because it's an example of cross-functional folks like th- that idea would have never been discovered if they didn't have a suggestion program in place, which Amazon has actually had in place since very early on in its founding. Um, other than that though, I would just try to show, understand leadership goals, find examples of how crowdsourcing or innovation challenges have worked with other organizations and achieving those goals, uh, and then make it so that there's a really low barrier to entry, meaning running it as a one-time pilot versus something that has to be recurring. So at the end of the day, just to add on to that a little bit more, it comes down to whether a leader is going to move forward with something is, uh, you know, an evaluation in their mind of we have a goal. Here's the basket of things that we can do to achieve that goal is what we're considering in running this innovation challenge. Is there a case to be made that this method can be more effective uh, than other methods that we're considering? Uh, And I might be biased, but my response is always, you know, nine times out of 10, yes to that. But it's really just framing it in your mind. Hey, what else is being considered in terms of initiatives to help achieve these goals uh, that I'm proposing that we run a challenge uh, to achieve? And then making sure that you're, you know, aware of that and like making the comparison um, and including that in your presentation. Um, See a question from Luis here as well. So rewarding, especially early on doing rewards. um, One that we found really effective. uh, Some folks go over the top with it. But if, if you have like, it doesn't have to be a very large budget at all. I would suggest doing stuff upfront for early folks that engage early and then also for folks that get shortlisted then for folks that get their ideas ultimately implemented. So just having it for actually each one of those phases. Something else we've seen, depending on if uh, you have um, uh, collaboration, like folks can comment and leave feedback or suggest improvements to each other's ideas is giving out prizes, not just for submitters, but for folks that are adding value by leaving comments or being additive right to the idea. Uh, and really engaging in that way. Uh, what you're gonna see is actually, if, if anybody has seen the stats on social media, it's not quite the 80-20 rule, but essentially if you look at the folks that post, uh, it's uh, a very, it's like, I think it's 15% or 20% or something like that. Uh, then you have another 40% that are going to consume uh, in terms of, en- or excuse me, engage with the primary content that's created. So you post on LinkedIn or Facebook, there's going to be that 40% that comments or like, right, on your Facebook or LinkedIn post. But then you also have this other audience, which is just purely observing. They're not going to interact or engage with content on social at all. And we've seen something similar in our platforms where it's you have a certain percentage that are going to be the originators, certain percentage of folks much larger that are going to be um, the folks that add on to the primary content uh, and then the folks that just are consuming that. So you want to make sure to at least incentivize those two different groups in terms of the commenters as well as the submitters. You're welcome. Does that help, Luis? It's a little bit long-winded there, but. Awesome. Okay. And do we have any further questions? Does anybody want to unmute themselves and ask? Yeah, I would like to. Hi there. Hi. Go ahead. Hi. Um, thank you. I'm um, sorry, I missed the beginning of the session, so I really hope that I will be able to see the recording of this so really concise and good message. Um, question about hackathon. In my company in the past, we successfully used hackathons as a place to solve more as a um, technical challenges where we would mm-hmm. utilize, so it would be around a certain technology or the platform, and uh, we would build this across the organization. We had more than 400 people participating in this, but it was really tailored to the technical challenge. How did you use the hackathons? Like Just based on experience from other companies, hackathons for the business challenges. I never thought about this, but it's really made me think maybe we should try. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's um, we see a lot of folks use them. Our primary is actually for our business challenges. I would say we see folks use them quite often, though, for doing like very tactical things, where the submissions might be private and there's not as much collaboration. Maybe there's teams, maybe there aren't that submit. But um, yeah, thank you very much, and, and thank you for your kind words on, on the feedback. We'll definitely share this out after. Great. Thanks for sharing those resources, Luke. 
Um, outside of that, I know we, we have quite a few folks in here. Um, just to get a feel for the room, how many folks currently in here, just by raising hands, are actually have run an innovation challenge before? I'm going to pull a participant list to see. I've never, this is kind of a real time idea here. Let's see how this works. Um, okay, great. And then uh, if you could lower your hand, so you got like three or four folks that have ran them in the past. How many folks now are considering, just basically you're in the early phases, like, hey, we just need to build buy in um, for the program and are trying to evaluate how to best like implement this for the first time in our company? We got one, two, oh, wow, okay, we got a lot. Um, three, four, okay. So that's a nice mix of folks in here. Um, and anyways, we'll, we'll make sure to share our resources afterwards to appeal to both both the groups. Um, and if anybody has you know questions for us, uh, we're here to help. So you can reach me directly at uh, Kobe, C-O-B-Y, uh, at ideawake.com. Um, or just go to our website, ideawake.com, uh, and you can, you know, book a time with us there. Uh, we'd love to talk with you. So additionally, I think we'll be available and accessible on the innovators platform directly as well. Okay. Awesome. Great. Thank you very much, Kobe. Uh, excellent as always. And, uh, of course, if anybody, if you have questions, you can, uh, put it in our community discussion section uh, as always we are going to post a link to the next session as well and uh, this was good thank you guys very much and i hope that you all still have a, a wonderful day thanks everybody